people have a different version of the truth depending on their position within this greater system. So I've taken all of the facts that he set down in his text and I've presented them in my own language. And I've done so in part because I want to create a story that people will sit around and listen. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Coborn. And hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a good day. You know, um, sometimes mental illness can feel pretty hopeless. And Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. And our, our guest today has written a book that that really shines a light on schizophrenia from the inside. And one of the things you know, is th- that I found really appealing about this book is that Bob, you know, the uh, person with schizophrenia, never, never seemed to be hopeless. You know, it's, right. it's, it it's seemed true. like he always, he had such a positive outlook on things given what he'd been through. And, and he, he was always up for something else always or doing something, something, something different, else. you know? Yeah. yeah. So our guest today is Sandy Allen, who's the author of A Kind of Miraculous Paradise, A True Story About Schizophrenia. Sandy writes and speaks about mental health, gender, normalcy, and power. Their essays and feature stories have been published by BuzzFeed News, CNN Opinion, Bon Appetit, and Pop-Up Magazine. They also founded and ran the online-only Literary Quarterly WAGS Review. Sandy is non-binary trans. They live in the Catskills, New York, with their husband, dog, cats, garden beds, and sourdough starter. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Sandy. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I described my whole zoo at at the end there. (laughs) <laughs> so so how long have you had your sourdough starter? I started this one actually right around when this book was publishing over a year ago. I, I kind of wanted to give myself the the, the treat of, of taking up a sourdough bread baking practice. It's been really <laughs> wonderful. Now, you said the book was published over a year ago, and I believe the paperback is just coming out now. Is that correct? Yep. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, I've, Great. I've just been touring around um, since the paperback published this January. And I saw you were in Iowa City at Prairie Lights. I was. Yeah, I was at Prairie Lights, yeah. which for me is my old stomping ground because I did the MFA, at, um, the, the nonfiction MFA at the University of Iowa. So I actually, right. the first several years that I was writing this book, I, I was sitting in Prairie Lights' cafe, basically. If I wasn't uh-huh. home or teaching, I was sitting in Prairie Lights' cafe. So it was really, I, I was emotional, honestly, returning oh, there. It felt I really special. Bet. Tell us a little bit about this book. It, it's an unusual book. Because yeah, so 10 years ago this year, I had just moved to Iowa City, and I got a call from a number that I didn't have stored in my phone, and I answered it, and I recognized the voice right away, even though it was someone I hadn't spoken to in a long time, my Uncle Bob. He had this really, you know, like, hey, man, how you doing? You know, kind of like Northern California in the 60s sound, and so I recognized him right away. And um, Bob was my mom's older brother, and he lived up in the desert by himself further north in the state. Um, and he was uh, he's a, a solitary guy. He called himself a hermit. He played guitar. He smoked cigarettes. You know, I'd, I'd sort of known him at a distance, um, especially when I was a little kid um, at family reunions in uh, northern Minnesota. I'd seen him a bit in person back then. But for the most part, you know, he wasn't someone who I'd, Um, you know, spent time with in any great length in my life. So he called me and he wanted to mail me something that he'd written. Um, And a few weeks later, this uh, envelope showed up at my house. And it was a a story that he'd typed on his typewriter in all capital letters. And it was very misspelled. And it was punctuated with primarily colons and no, (laughs) no paragraph breaks. So it was just these huge walls of text. And it was his entire life story, really, from his earliest recollections of his childhood through to the present, living in the desert alone for decades. And on its cover, he wrote, this is a true story about being labeled a psychotic, paranoid schizophrenic. And so he'd put that right up up, up top. And uh, yeah, initially, I was 
pretty turned off by the whole thing. You know, it literally stunk like cigarettes when it showed up. And and there was profanity and racism. And I was just like, like, whoa, I don't want to deal with whatever this is. And I tried to kind of, you know, put it back in an envelope and into a drawer and forget that it was there, um, which didn't really work because <laughs> I was also kind of curious um, about what he'd written. And, and I happened to be starting this uh, writing degree, you know, and we were specifically looking at in in nonfiction, you know, writing workshops, we were thinking about where do you draw that line between fiction and nonfiction. And I had read enough of Bob's story. I had I had seen, you know, for example, some of the extra extraterrestrial moments in his story. <laughs> And and I wondered, you know, I wondered about those in terms of these conversations that I was having in my graduate courses. Um, does Bob's story count as nonfiction? So over time, my curiosity got the better of me, and I read his whole story. And then I tried to figure out how to write about what he'd sent me in a little essay for class. Um, and nobody liked that essay. I often say this story to encourage other writers um, who failed. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> it was what a real they, failure yeah, of an essay. What yeah. criticism did they have about it? Well, so what I'd done was I had this conundrum with Bob's text. You know, he'd written in this in this very unique way, right? In his 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 sort of self-styled spellings and the colons and even just his the poetry of how he wrote. You know, because he had that sort of 60s inflection even in his his written writing and um so i had i had tried to write an essay that had a little bit of my memoir remembering him when i was a little kid at the lake and then i quoted him in all caps you know the big uncle bob caps and mm. everybody found this to be a problem but it was interesting because there wasn't a consensus about what was wrong with what I'd done in quoting him that way. Some people thought it looked bad, I should fix his spellings. Um, and I, I noticed that no one had listened. No one had really paid attention to the substance of Bob's writing in, in the parts that I'd quoted him, um, which I found really interesting, that, that people were really caught up uh, on the look, but they weren't really listening to what he'd had mm -hmm. to say. Wow. I found his his writing extremely interesting. When I was reading, I mean, it, I, I <laughs> this is a page turner for me. It really was, because I just, yeah. uh, you know, I just couldn't Thank imagine what, what was he going to do next. You know, he, he did. He was always up for something, something new. Yeah. He, he tried so many things. It was wonderful. It really was. Yeah, and so what I did after that failure was I tried to figure out how could I get someone interested to hear this story because your reaction is honestly my ideal reaction you know it's like what I was going for um, I really wanted people to be able to hear just what Bob had gone through you know and to mm -hmm. sort of see it from his side and so I thought all right I'll use my writerly skills as it were I'll take this story <laughs> that Bob has sent me and I will stage these scenes. I will, you know, make these places come to life. I'm going to, I'm going to really, you know, I really crafted it, you know, in order to always think about what's the reader's experience here. Am I, as the writer, working hard enough to keep the reader around? So I worked on that side of the project for five or six years. Wow. Actually, the metaphor I like to use is a cover version. You know, I, I'm playing a version of Bob's song. Um, it's got my style, but, you know, it's, it's, it's his tune. He's the one who wrote it here. And, and I first heard his version, you know, whatever, ten years ago, and the first time I ever finished reading his whole text, I went, whoa, you know, there was something there that I, I didn't yet understand everything that I was feeling, but, you know, I really reacted to it too. And I, I think all I've been trying to do is figure out how can I let more people have that feeling, that gift of, of hearing Bob's story on his terms. So eventually the book grew its second element, which is in a second font. And it's, it starts with the story that, you know, I told you about getting this call from my uncle, getting this thing in the mail. And it's also the part of the text where I am examining a lot of the, the wider contexts here. Um, you know, the, the society around Bob, the family around him, exploring the way that other people remember all these events, exploring the truth value generally of a lot of the, the topics that I think are, are germane as we listen to Bob's story. Um, and it's also where, you know, I'm kind of telling my own journey um, as I have – 
uh, spent the last decade considering the meaning of, you know, a phrase like psychotic, paranoid, schizophrenic. Which doesn't have a really specific meaning, does it? I don't know. It's, it's almost like a flexible diagnosis. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the things I'm 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 really trying to unpack in this book is um the status of a diagnosis like schizophrenia is um yeah, as you say, it's a little hard to pin down and and where does that come from? It comes from the fact that there's a a profession psychiatry that advances a lot of ideas about oh, these are the various ways in which a brain can be you know, thought to be diseased, um, you know, uh, basically diseases of the soul, which, you know, psychiatry means soul doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and so these these diseases remain biologically uh, very unconfirmed. Um, and you've got a big debate that exists, uh, one that I don't think the public has heard about generally, but one that is very loud if you know where to tune in. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically about you know, what does a label like schizophrenia accomplish if you've got people, including my Uncle Bob, and he was someone who felt very strongly about this stuff, who say, hey, this label itself was confining and oppressive, and more, I think the label became an excuse for various treatment under the auspices of psychiatric care that the individual in question, you know, winds up saying later on, wait a minute, you know, that hurt me, that didn't help me. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things I'm taking on in this book is really trying to figure out, you know, I don't really think that it's it's about either or, black or white, but I do think it's about there's a lot more going on in this area than I think a lot of us hear about. And part of the problem is we're not really hearing from the likes of Uncle Bob, you know. Right That's now right. Our, our, our social discussion around mental illness, schizophrenia specifically, um, really excludes uh, a lot of the voices of those like Bob who I think have really seen it, you know, those who've really been inside. Been there and done that. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, and I think right now we are, we are we, the, what we do here um, is, is, you know, a lot of what professionals have to say, and that's not to say that professionals don't have a lot of valid things to say, but I think one of the things I'm trying to show in this story is how people have a different version of the truth depending on their position within this greater system. Mm -hmm. So I've taken all of the facts that he set down in his text and I've presented them in my own language. Um, and, and I've done so in part because I want to create a story that people will sit around and listen. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, Bob was a lot of things and he was a very talented, um, I think he, he had a lot of talents, including creative talents, and I think his book was very ambitious, but he was not a professional writer. Um, and I think that that was one of those challenges that I that I saw immediately when I tried to share his story with people. And so that form was one I adapted over time. But I think it's also an important imaginative exercise in a way to um, because the speaking position of that side of the text uh, is what you'd call a limited, omniscient third person. So basically, I've created a world in which what Bob said was true is true, you know. Um, the whole world in that side of the, the text is, is, is biased toward him and his, and his account of everything. Um, and I think that the, that's important, I think, for, for maybe those of us who haven't been in a position like his to really imagine, you know, the, the full, you know, uh, experience of, of what it's like for, for someone like him. So it was a, it was a creative uh, sort of solution that I came up with to that question of how do you get people to listen to a story that I think we are socialized to ignore. There's, there's a passage at the beginning which I kind of think of as like the Rosetta Stone. So I've got the, the part about Lydia Triantopoulos, mm -hmm. the, the love of his life, who he knows as a child. So the reader mm -hmm. early on encounters that, you know, original Bob passage. And I don't know what it's like, you know, to just get that Bob writing right at the top. Um, but so the reader sees that, and then the beginning of my rendition of his story opens with that same passage. Um, and so, you know, the, the and, and part of what's going on, too, in my sort of representation of his story is, um, you know, I think I'm trying to figure out how to, how to shape this story in such a way that I can also be occasionally switching back into my own voice and uh, giving readers um, some of that bigger context. This was a, a huge project, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you said you worked yeah, on it for five see, to six years. Yeah. Uh, I, all told, it was about eight, yeah, that I was writing the book. Wow. Um, because I, I, I wrote the sort of the cover version of Bob's story for the first five or six, and then then I got the publisher. And then, you know, they really wanted to add that, that really important um, context around a lot of the, the story that I was telling. And so it took a, a number of years to kind of uh, do a lot more of the journalistic activities, I guess, that also took place. I was, I was interviewing everybody in the family who would, you know, who wanted to share their points of view on all this stuff. I was interviewing um, all the experts I could possibly talk to and, mm -hmm. and getting their take and people with a lot of uh, experience in this space and trying to hear, just really hear what was going on in order to figure out, okay, well, what do I need to then share with my reader? This has to be an extremely difficult subject for even people who think that they're experts in this field because you really don't know what's going on in somebody else's brain. Hmm. I mean, how yeah, can I, we know, you know? Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Um, the, I've, 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 I've been lucky to have so many conversations with people who have a lot of knowledge in this space, you know, whether that's professional knowledge, personal knowledge, often it's both. Um, and I think that a lot of people have a lot of pain in these areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people want to do better. Um, I think a lot of professionals particularly, uh, I find, are very frustrated with uh, what they can't do, what they can't accomplish, um, often because of systemic problems. You know, they don't have the resources they need. Um, and and I, I do think that what's interesting, too, about this moment in time in our, in our mental health care uh, history in this country is there is also no one professional opinion. You know, it's really all over the place. Um, pretty much, and I have a line along these lines in the book, but pretty much every single person I've spoken to about this stuff feels a different way. Um, and I mm. think that, that that sort of plurality um, is also part of what's going on here. We have a really, um, a lot of people bring a lot of their own understandings to a lot of these topics. I do think it's also important to note that, you know, I think that at the end of the day, we are more exposed to what professionals think about a lot of these topics and how they see things. Um, and I think we are just, in our society, less exposed to the points of view of people like my uncle who've been on the other side of that, you know, receiving end of that diagnosis or that, that unwanted needle, you know. Now, what, what, what law was it that President Kennedy signed Right before he was killed, and it had yeah, something so that to do was with the mental health. Mental Health Act. Yeah, so so that was that was Pre President Kennedy. It's very good. Right before he died, his last legislative act was this Community Mental Health Act that was uh, supposed to help. Uh, take the pressure off the states, uh, which had been, for about a century, a lot of the states had been funding mental health care, and uh, many states had these asylums that were very large and overcrowded and, mm -hmm. um, you know, really uh, torturous uh, places. And, uh, and so Kennedy was trying to move that uh, system into one that was more community-based. Um, but what happened was um, that, that effort to bias funding away from the states and specifically mental health funding was successful, but there was never any implementation after President Kennedy's death. There was never any implementation, any follow through on what was supposed to replace uh, that state yeah. system that was defunded, you know, and isn't that such an American thing to do? So, what happened was, you know, then you get things like with Ronald Reagan, deinstitutionalization, so the sort of very intentional, aggressive defunding of state mental health care. Um, and that's why, into the 80s and 90s and the present, we have, for example, um, populations of people who are homeless who have severe mental illness diagnoses that are very, you know, much higher than in the general public. Uh, you have, you know, an overwhelm, you have much higher rates of people in, in prison and jail who have severe mental illness diagnoses. So a lot of that, uh, you know, state mental health spending has transferred over to the criminal justice system um, to, today in America. And of course, the use, the use of drugs by more and more people, I suppose, has a 
made this even worse, hasn't it? I, I would I would say that yeah, it's important to highlight the the rise of psychiatric drugs. Um, I think never has uh, pharma the pharmaceutical industry is so wealthy and so powerful in this country, um, and specifically psychiatric pharmaceuticals have been some of the blockbusters of the last you know couple of decades of American pharmaceutical companies um, and worldwide. But you know you have uh, right now you have so many medications that are that are really a aggressively pushed on, uh, you know, providers and then on patients. And a lot of that um, is a lot of the, the science about these medications and their effects and is funded by industry as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, you know, I think I'm highlighting in, in highlighting Bob's uh, voice in this story is that he's one of the people, I think, who's really, um, who, who would like to be heard on the topic of psychiatric pharmaceuticals, um, because as we, as we see in his story, um, there's so many points at which um, that, that psychiatric, quote, care, you know, doesn't really seem like what he wants, uh, nor does it really seem like what will help him. Um, and so, you know, I'm trying to contextualize some of his opinions about pharma, which were pretty negative, um, in, in these broader conversations that have been going on for a long time about, hey, what, is, what, is, what should the role of industry, you know, pharmaceutical manufacturers specifically, what should their role be in the creation of psychiatric knowledge in our society? And I think what would happen if we were to turn the volume down on what pharma has to say about people like Bob? On the right. other hand, it seems like when he would stop taking medication, he would eventually have another sort of psychotic break. Yeah, one of the things that we're, we're sort of feeling in his story is this really um, ambivalent relationship that he has with his medications. And there are eras where he stops taking medications and things get really bad. I, I would One thing I would want to note is that um, a lot of people who are very uh, active in this space of talking about psychiatric psychiatric medication withdrawal um, is that, you know, that's something that should be done always with a provider. You know, a patient and provider should be should be withdrawing together. When when you've got, you know, in psych psychiatric medications often, you know, uh, come with a steep host of side effects and also can be very addictive. And so, you know, even folks who are in those kind of really um, anti-medication uh, sort of people are, are often very quick to say, you know, you've got to be really careful with, with withdrawal off any medication, you know, that should be, in theory, done in concert with a provider. And I think in general, you know, it's easy to sort of lampoon these chemicals, you know, and say, oh, here's the problem, it's this drug, or, you know, or even recreational drugs, oh, you know, here's the problem, it's cannabis or it's LSD. Um, and I do think that in general, we sort of overemphasize the role that drugs are having here. And we over, we, I think we overemphasize both their power and good and bad. You know, I think that there's a lot of folks really wish that um, psychiatric medications were magic bullets. Mm -hmm. And I think we've had a lot of decades to really watch that play out. And what's frustrating for a lot of people is that that really hasn't been the case, not in a public health standpoint. Um, you know, there's journalists like Robert Whitaker, who I think have done a lot of work to really evidence the toll that this sort of uh, intense prescription of psychiatric medications has had on so many people. Um, and so, you know, I think in general we have to be thinking about Okay, what's the role of chemicals? Sure, and but moreover, you know, what's the what are the other ways in which we are missing the point if we only focus on chemical uh, chemical triggers and chemical solutions? So that that was a very good point that you made because I I didn't think about that about the fact that when he was getting off of medication, he was usually doing it by himself and just stopping. And not yeah and, yeah, and not being yeah. weaned off, and and so that may have been more the problem than the than that. he may not have needed the medication, but he certainly didn't couldn't get off of it that way. And you feel in his story that there's sort of other stuff going on too, like he doesn't have a lot of say. You know, that's that's one example. It's like he doesn't seem to have a lot of say in terms of what happens to his his body, his mind, and so on. Um, he doesn't have a lot of support, you know, from other people who understand him. You know, he has authorities that he interacts with, whether that's his parents, his psychiatrist, the law, 
Um, and so I think that's actually the situation for a lot of people with diagnoses like schizophrenia. Um, they, they don't necessarily have access to a menu of options for treatment that is actually very generous and really is listening to what, you know, research has shown and lots of decades of experience has shown really helps people who do struggle with, with the kinds of things that Bob struggled with because it's very clear, for example, that he struggles socially, that he has trouble fitting in, he has trouble keeping steady work, um, he has trouble living up to some of the expectations of our society. Um, and it's clear that he perhaps could have really benefited from having, you know, and, and sometimes even when he's, because he goes to different hospitals, you know, and he has different reactions to those sorts of different situations. And when he's in the hospital, that's very, um, you know, it's very, it's, it's, it's incarceration. He's involuntarily, you know, he's being injected with stuff that he doesn't know what it is. He's being forced into different clothes. He's being put in that locked cell. You know, and, and you're thinking about that from his point of view. How could this possibly be care? You know, how could this possibly be done with him, you know, with his own mind um, at heart? You know, I think that you really feel that as you read it from his side. And then you can foil that with some of those experiences he has in a different facility later on where he likes his doctor. He likes that his doctor seems to give it to him straight. He likes that he has access to a patio to sit outside and he can play piano and stuff. And you feel how those sorts of things make a huge difference, you know, when he's got a job that, that, that's working for him or when he has a group of friends or when he has a girlfriend, you know, you can feel how that really works for him. So it may be not be a question of, you know, should he or should he not be on X or Y chemical, but in general, is the sort of care that he's being offered something that's being offered with him as a fellow, you know, does he have a seat at that table? Mm -hmm. Is he being and given that, you know, dignified position of, of being allowed to say, hey, this is what's good for my mind and body. Well, the, the thing to me is that there are no two people exactly alike. And so I may take uh, drug A and my friend may take drug A and they're not going to react the same way in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Because I have, I have taken, for instance, pain medicine in my life that kills a pain, yes, but it just upset me, so upset my gut so much I absolutely could not take it. Mm -hmm. So I think probably when when you're in an institution where you're being, being given stuff that's supposed to do such and such and it may not be doing it at all, but you have no control over that, that must yeah. really be terribly frustrating. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's keenly observed, and I think part of the point is that so often for psychiatric patients particularly, historically and now, you know, that sort of right to say, hey, I don't like this, you know, that gets yeah. taken away from people. That power to say, hey, this, this hurts me or I don't, I don't agree with this decision, you know, this becomes really complicated when you've got families, when you've got the state disagreeing with what's best for a patient. But I think particularly so, given what I was saying before about the state of psychiatric knowledge in our culture. So much of what doctors know, so much of what insurance companies know, families know, so much of what patients hear began as pharmaceutical marketing. Um, and I think until we really reckon with that, until we at the very least up the volume on Uncle Bob's point of view on a lot of these things, I don't know that we're going to be set up to help him when he's in that really tough spot because I don't want to deny that there's a lot of distress, right? You know, there are a lot of people who day in, day out are dealing with some sometimes very debilitating um, psychiatric symptoms. And there are a family of those people and loved ones of those people who are going, wait a minute, how do I help this person? You've got professionals who are looking at patients who are suffering in their families and go, how do I help these people and so on. So I mean, I, 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 I really sympathize with those who are really living this right now. Um, but I also think that, you know, what's fun about being a writer is that I can imagine. Um, and, you know, I really imagine a, a more utopian world where what we are offering people, like like Bob, when they're having a really tough day, is something that's been created very much with his humanity in mind, you know, and kind of at the fore. Um, mm -hmm. And I say that in part because I've had the good fortune to spend a lot of time hanging out with people who have had diagnoses like Bob given to them and who've been for many decades, some, in some cases, creating, um, you know, alternative mental health care, uh, often in the form of stuff like 
support groups for people who have um, trauma backgrounds, support groups for LGBT people, support groups for people who hear voices, um, safe houses for people who are having psychiatric emergencies, um, these kinds of things that can be so revolutionary for people, especially people who are uh, challenged um, not only by life and by you know society and who've had sometimes very traumatic experiences, but people who are not necessarily able to maintain connections with others. And I do think that one of those really, really, really just central lessons about mental illness and mental health that I think we can all stand to keep in mind is that connection with people, you know, not being isolated, this has such a huge impact upon mental health. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Sandy Allen, author of A Kind of Miraculous Paradise. And miraculous is spelled a little unusually, M-I-R-R-A-C-U-L-A-S, if you're trying to look this book up online. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that I'm, would be Bob's spelling of yep, mm-hmm. miraculous. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, um, and I think that that's a good example of when I had those moments of wanting to quote him. You know, mm-hmm. I really, I, I've always loved the way he spelled <laughs> Miraculous Paradise. You know, I, I think it was the first time I ever read it. I, I, I loved it. You know, I could I could never do better. <laughs> have you, <laughs> you know, since this book came out, have you had other people with similar mental health issues come to you and say, can you tell my story? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I I, I think what one thing that's funny about being a writer is, especially once you have one book, a lot everyone actually thinks they're suddenly your agent and they can assign you book number two. Um, but yeah, you know, um, I I have had that experience. I mean, I was just going to say in general, I've had the real incredible experience of hearing from people who um, have identified with Bob for whatever reason, um, you know, who've said, like, thank you for doing this, and, you know, people who've said, I'm going to give this to the people in my family who need to read it. Um, and I've also heard from people who have family with diagnoses like schizophrenia and who really, you know, identify with maybe some of the other characters in the story. And I've heard from, you know, this is kind of, for me, the wildest one, really enthusiastic psychiatrists. You know, people who've read this book and said, oh, my gosh, this has helped me understand my patients. This has changed how I think about my work. Um, people who work in mental health and, and health care gener- generally who I think have felt um, really gratified to, to sort of be able to hear it this way and, and who found this very contextualizing. And, and so it has been really a pleasure for me as an author to have that sense that I have um, gotten that kind of impossible coalition audience together, you know, because generally in this space, it's so fractured. Um, people are really only in their own silo. They're only hearing other people who think what they think, um, you know, sound familiar. And so I really <laughs> wanted to create, I wanted to create a text that I, that would be more accessible, you know, that more kinds of people would be able to walk into this story and walk out the other side with their, with their heads a little bit changed um, you know, tuned a little more into Frequency Bob. Um, but, and I think that I also really have been gratified when people who've read it um, have told me, you know, I didn't know anything about this stuff. I never thought about this stuff before because, frankly, that's who I was, you know, before Bob mailed me his, his life story. I was someone who really didn't care about schizophrenia or mental illness or mental health. You know, these weren't, these weren't on my mind at all. And so I think that a big part of, of the social change that's got to take place here is that we've got to realize that we are all bound up in these conversations about what you're providing for for somebody in the event that they have a really, really bad day. Um, And I think part of it is there's no guarantees you won't ever be that person. You know, there's no guarantees your loved one won't be that person who needs um, that kind of help. Well, I've always wondered, too, it's like how do you, like where is the line between just sort of being weird and being mentally ill or <laughs> or I've yeah. said there's a very fine line between sometimes between spirituality and psychosis right. and exactly and I yeah yeah where how where is that line how do you define it or is it even a line well I think a lot of it is is um, you know, schizophrenia, it might not be biologically proven, 
um, but it is socially quite real. So that line is if a psychiatrist or another provider who's qualified to do so has said, this is what you are. You know, if you've gotten that code put in your paperwork and it's off to the insurance company, then it's real. You know, when you've got a diagnosis like that, it's a social reality. It's a it's a political reality as well. You know, if you've got a severe mental illness diagnosis, that can be grounds for you to lose your job, your home, your kids in a, in a, in a, uh, a fight with an ex or something. You know, there's a lot of real world ramifications to receiving a, a psychiatric diagnosis. And it's incredibly, um, it, 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 as, you, as you allude, you know, it, it has so much to do with uh, the context in which a person is seen. And I think whether that provider whether that you know whether the state even is incentivized to pathologize you know to see someone who's really upset or to see someone who's saying something that to you doesn't sound real and to decide that therefore this person has this label and these labels are often you know they're very pessimistic right so not only are these not really understood biologically but we also have a sort of assertion of well you're going to be this way forever unless you know we can give you this and it will help with your symptoms it has a whole you know, low to side effects, and it will maybe shorten your life if you consume it long term, but that's the best we can do for you given this really pessimistic diagnosis that we've given you. Um, and I think this is the whole system that I'm, I'm definitely standing and with my arms folded and my brow furrowed, and I'm going, well, what are we offering people here? You know, if we're really seeking to tell them that, you know, you're irrevocably damaged now, is that going to help? And I think, you know, the, the common sense answer and actually the research answer are the same. You know, there's been a lot of research that has shown that giving someone a really pessimistic label and a really pessimistic forecast about their health indeed hurts their health, you know. Um, and if we are doing so needlessly, that's especially concerning. So I think part of what a kind of miraculous paradise is seeking to do is begin a conversation that's along the lines of, okay, well, how could we help the likes of Bob or the likes of, you know, whoever it is who needs that extra, you know, community support support in creating relationships, support in processing trauma. Um, and I think, yeah, part of it is going to be an exercise in continuing, I think, to liberate our minds from this false binary of sane insane. Um, because it isn't scientific, as you allude, it's slippery. Um, and does it ultimately help, you know, those on either side? I'm not sure it does. Um, and again, that's not to minimize the fact that sometimes people need help. Some people need a lot of help through their whole lives. Um, but I think that part of the shift that needs to take place here is toward people who are in those positions, who have, you know, uh, a diagnosis, who have a, a, who identify, for example, as having a psychosocial disability, that people in those positions are really given a voice, given a seat at the table, given the opportunity to self-define, given the opportunity to have access to care that is really common sense and thinking about what are the best ways to help people who have these kinds of challenges. You know, Sandy, I know there's some pretty well-known books written from the point of view of someone suffering depression, um, like William Styron, I think, had one. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that come, that springs to mind. Do you Andrew know Solomon, the mm -hmm. baby man, is, a, is another depression one. Okay. I don't know if you know that book, but it's great. Uh, can you say that again? Andrew Solomon, The Noonday Demon. The Noonday Demon. No, I have not heard, read that one. But what my question is, are there other books out there written from the perspective of somebody with schizophrenia or psychoses that give voice yeah. to that the way that, that your book does? <laughs> Well, I think my book is a special snowflake and no book in the history of the world will ever be like it. Oh, yeah, but definitely, you know, and, and I'll, I'll mention this. So I have a website, hellosandyallen.com, and um, on, on my website I have a page with resources, and that includes recommendations of other books. Um, and I'm always updating that as I read new things and, and encounter new things. So if, if people are, you know, uh, interested in reading more in this space generally, including first-person perspectives, I I've, I've assembled a whole list 
there with some various recommendations. Um, and, you know, there's one, one book that's actually like many decades old that I find myself recommending all the time because I, I do think it's sort of a forgotten classic, um, but it's called I Never Promised You a Rose Garden um, mm. by Joanne Greenberg. There was a country ballad that had the same name. Yeah, um, right. You know, it's probably in your head by now. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> Um, I, I never promised you a rose in. garden. <laughs> It, it, it was also made into a movie and stuff, and it, it had a, it had a big popularity back in the day. And I think it's a it's a it's if if we are all you know I think that one flew over the cuckoo's nest is often you know kind of the the one book about psychiatric uh, stuff that you know people are familiar with. But I really wish it had been um, I never promised you a rose garden that had remained in the American imagination through the last half decade. She was a uh, uh, Joanne Greenberg was her real name. It was published under a pseudonym Hannah Green, um, and Joanne Greenberg was writing. A about her own recovery from schizophrenia, and she was also highlighting this particularly talented and incredible psychiatrist who had helped her through that journey. And that story takes place right before psychiatric pharmaceuticals, um, you know, hit the scene. Um, and so it's a portrait of a very different sort of conception and road out of this kind of, of in her case, very debilitating um, experience, but you also really get an incredible world into what she was experiencing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I... I, I, I I didn't read that book until I was really done with mine, uh, kind of thank goodness, because I maybe would have been very intimidated. But it is, it is so worth revisiting if you're someone who cares about these topics. Sandy, would you like to read a little bit from A Kind of Miraculous Paradise? Sure. I'll read from the very top. The first chapter here is called Genesis. It's kind of a joke. Um, <laughs> late one hot summer night, Several years ago, I got a call from a number that wasn't in my phone. I had recently moved to the Midwest for graduate school and was at a party in someone's living room. I wouldn't usually answer such a call, but in recent days I'd met and given my number to a lot of people. I found a bedroom and shutting the door behind me, answered, Hey man, how you doing? It was my uncle, my mom's older brother Bob. So I couldn't tell you when we'd last spoken. I recognized his voice right away. Bob had been a teenager in Berkeley in the 60s, and his voice sounded stuck there. He sprinkled his sentences with, yeah, man, and right on, and far out. He laughed a lot. His was a wild, wheezing laugh. And given that he was a smoker, his laughs would often devolve into a loud hack. Hey, Bob, I said. I set my glass on a dresser and flicked on a light. He asked if I had moved yet, and I said yes. Some relative must have told him that, and that I was studying writing. Hey, I wrote a book, man. I wrote the story of my life, he said. Is that right? He talked a while. He asked for my new address, and without much thought, I gave it to him. I told him I had to go, though. Oh, all right. Sorry, man, he said, and repeated several times. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, man. It was unclear what he was thanking me for or what I had agreed to do. <laughs> it's totally fine, I said, and hanging up quickly forgot about the conversation altogether. I didn't know my uncle well. Most, the most time I'd spent around him had been when I was a kid in the 90s. I'd grown up just north of San Francisco in a little enclave of aging hippies on the coast, and most of the rest of my mom's family lived about an hour away in the East Bay. Bob's house was somewhere else, somewhere I'd never been. Sometimes Bob would be at my grandfather's house when we went for Christmas. In the summer, my grandfather would fly us all out to his vacation place in northern Minnesota, and sometimes Bob would be there, too. The property had a main lodge in its center and an old tennis court and a dock. Little sandy paths ran through the birches, connecting everything together. The single-family cabins were each named after a different tree. When my parents, my little brother, and I joined, we stayed in a cabin with a sign beside its screen door that read Pine. Bob was single and didn't have kids. He didn't often water ski or swim or play tennis. He'd mostly just sit off to the side, in the shade, wearing long sleeves and jeans, sometimes a vest. His hair was long and blonde beneath a dusty cap, and he wore glasses. He smoked all the time, mostly cigarettes, but sometimes a pipe that smelled like wood and cherries. He didn't sleep in a cabin like the rest of us, but up in the lodge, up a dark staircase I don't remember ever ascending. Bob was a musician, and he knew I liked to sing, 
In the evenings, before the bell in the lodge was rung for dinner, I'd hear him playing guitar through our cabin screen. I'd go sit beside him. I'd fiddle with the moss on the cement step, and Bob would strum, and we'd try to figure out what to play. We didn't know many of the same songs. Sometimes we just took turns describing those we did know. Sometimes he just played or I just sang. Sometimes we made up songs together, songs that were absurd or funny to either or both of us. If you'd asked me then, that would have been my main opinion of my Uncle Bob. He was hilarious. Mm -hmm. One day, Bob and I were buckled into the back seat of a rental car, waiting for someone to drive us into the town nearby, probably to play miniature golf and get ice cream. From his pocket, Bob pulled out a powdery plastic bag of pills. He removed one, held it up, and then chewed it with his teeth like steak. He laughed like he wanted me to laugh, too, so I did. He produced another pill and did the same. Several pills later, the ritual was finished, and he put the bag away. Something was frightening about this. Why are you taking pills, I asked. It's noon. Gotta take pills at noon, he said and grinned. I smiled back. Later, I found my mom. She spent her days down on the dock wearing sunglasses and a big hat, killing mosquitoes and horseflies with a pair of swatters. Why does Bob take pills at noon, I asked. The lake's water stank in the midsummer heat. Because he's crazy, she answered. Why? I think Dad sent him to military schools after the divorce or something, she said, and he got messed up in there. My mom is a shy woman, and this was the kind of topic that made her face redden and her voice fall. And that was from the beginning of A Kind of Miraculous Paradise, a true story about schizophrenia by Sandy Allen. So I know that um, there was some touchiness with other members of the family about this project as you were working on it. How did it ever, like almost stop you from moving forward? Oh, I mean, it was really, um, yeah, I think it was, uh, it's funny because a book is such a slow-moving thing, you know. You can give up on it for two hours. (laughs) 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 But in the scheme of ten years, you know. (laughs) Um, You know, there was was just so many, so many days for so many reasons that I quit in my heart, you know, that I was like, I'm done. I'm going to figure out how to walk away from this and I can't do it. You know, I think that was a lot of it, just feeling like I can't, I can't do it. I can't figure out how to, how to make this work. Um, And I, and yeah, I mean, I think um, for, for, you know, uh, as I've answered questions about this project over the last year plus, you know, a lot of people have asked, uh, how does the family feel? What do people think? Um, and you know what I tend to say is the answer is complicated. These are real people. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I, I do like to say, though, that um, for some people in my family particularly, this project has been so gratifying, you know, that these, especially, for example, my grandmother, Bob's mom, um, is someone who I think, you know, she really mourned um, his loss, and I think she's someone who in general was so frustrated with uh, the way that the world saw her son and the gap between that and who she knew he was. Um, and so she's someone who's been just a supporter, you know, mm-hmm. through the last, through through it and, and has been, um, I think, really gratified that, that, that people have heard his story, you know, that, that it made it out there and, and that people are, are hearing their own stories in his story. Um, I I spoke to his cousin Jane on the phone just the other day. Jane, who's who's in the book, and and she said, right, right, I had I had just finished my um, 40th and final event for the book. I'm 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 going to be home for a little bit here, and I'm congratulations. Be quiet soon. Thank you. Yeah, and and Jane Jane said to me, you know, she just said, thank you for what you did for Bobby. Um, you know, and, and a little sentence like that, you know, that's big. Um, Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I mean, were there moments where I wanted to stop? Definitely. But I never did fully, you know, in part because I just, um, I, I really thought about what Bob had entrusted me with, um, and what he challenged me to do, honestly. Um, and his vote here really would override even my own will. Uh, at so many points, I think I would have rather given up, but I felt so, um, I, I felt very devoted, I think, to him and to the task that he had given me. Um, and that sort of, the faith that I grew, I think, um, uh, kept me going. And then 
as did um, as I really began to get to know a lot of people, um, as, you know, as a reporter, just someone who was going and, and reporting both for this book, but in, in just in general and, and future projects I'm working on, getting to know a lot of people who are touched, you know, by these topics day and get out, you know, really getting to know their stories and stuff, feeling the fact that like there is so much more here, you know, and that if I have something to contribute, I, I, I need to try. Now he he oh, had some concern about <clears throat> not wanting to hurt his father with if this if his story got out because in some ways his father in some ways he blamed his father but in other ways his father also provided a lot of support for him right yeah, and my hope is that readers who hear Bob's story will have the opportunity to understand how complicated that mm -hmm. relationship was, you know, and, and how, yeah, I mean, it's characterized by so much, um, you know, f feelings that are very big and contradictory. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was very important to me as I crafted this book was those really tough conversations that I had with everybody in the family, including his parents, his stepmom, about, you know, these, these topics that you know that he felt really differently than, you know, for example, his dad felt about X or Y. But I, I said to my grandfather and, and so on, you know, I really wanted to get their points of view in here because to me the truth was one that included, you know, him and them and his doctors and so on. Um, and so, you know, the, the members of my family, you know, that, that are in the book, everybody took time to really share their perspective on all this stuff. And I really tried to honor, you know, the, the, the complexity here because I don't think that anything is all that simple. Um, and so, yeah, I think the relationship that Bob had with his, um, with various, you know, people in his life who were in positions of power over him tended to be really complicated. And I, my hope, and, and I think this has been the experience of many readers is that people will see themselves in these in these relationships you know because I don't think Bob is the only person with a psychiatric history who's got a relationship with a parent as complicated as the one that he had with his dad um, and in fact I think that those kinds of relationships can be so complicated especially because our system provides so little support for for really all of us um, and it it falls to families um, and you know and and that has a toll that takes a toll on everybody um, and I think one of the things you're watching in in Bob's story and you can maybe just feel it is perhaps family members are not the people who need to be um, you know ultimately being the difference between someone being institutionalized for the rest of his life or not or having mm -hmm. somewhere to live for the rest of his life or not you know as I'm trying to highlight in Bob's story and I think as he was trying to highlight in writing his his story in the first place was he was incredibly indebted to his father you know he 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 knew better than anyone what he could not have accomplished for the for the last few decades of his life had it not been for the support that he received from his family so he was highlighting his gratitude and he also wanted to be heard about the things that had happened to him in his life that were you know not positive and that included experiences mm -hmm. in psychiatric care Care. And so I think that I wanted to provide that space where Bob could be heard for that level of nuance, you know, as opposed to being reduced to, oh, you know, you're just complaining about someone who helped you. Well, no, I don't think that was just what he was doing, you know. I think he's allowed to make a critique of the psychiatric system and, you know, acknowledge, you know, the very real debt of gratitude that he had to his family. Well, wasn't it a blessing that you were able to spend time, a little bit of time with him when you were younger? Yeah. And you both shared some music and so forth because he obviously had was sure that you could you could hear have his voice heard. Somehow yeah. he knew that you could do that. It's funny, right? You know, because I think that um, for the first few years, um, I well, I was really private about the fact that he'd mailed me this thing. You know, there's a, a lot of people in that family who um, have, uh, there, as I describe in the book, there was a big divorce back when, and so there's their passions run high, I'll put it that mm -hmm. way. So I was, you know, I had the, the good sense to kind of keep quiet about the fact that Bob had tried to enlist me to write something about him, you know, because even if I wrote a little thing about it for class, I figured it will never become anything, you know. I don't have a shot in, in, in the world, you know. Like, I was 
was really not, I was not confident. In fact, I was so unconfident, I was certain there would never be a book on the other side of this thing, because who would ever want this? You know, it's nonfiction with aliens in it, and it's got a misspelled title now, you know. It's written in two fonts. There was just so many things about it that, to me, made it feel unpublishable, and I think for that reason it felt safe to continue to really figure out if I could um, make this artistic object that I had in my mind's eye. Um, so, and, Sandy, uh, how you did know, you find a publisher? Yeah. How were you um, able well, to get it published? Uh, when I when I, uh, when I heard that Bob died, um, which was in the summer of 2014, um, I was very caught off guard. I really hadn't thought through a scenario where that was what happened. Um, if anything, I, I was being very cautious because I was worried about the generation older than him. Um, and I was perhaps, you know, I, I could see a world in which it would be easier to do this book if, if those folks were no longer living. Um, but what happened was the opposite. Suddenly Bob was dead. Um, and I, I was very sad and, and, and uh, I'm thrown off. And, um, and I figured, well, and I felt kind of right away, overwhelming guilt, just such, a, such guilt. Um, that I hadn't tried even harder uh, to, to, to cross those rather terrifying, you know, uh, gulfs of, you know, how do you get an agent, how do you get a publisher. Um, and in the interim, I had moved to New York City, and I, was, uh, I had a job. I was an editor, um, so I was very busy every day. I woke up every morning and, you know, got on the train and sat at my desk and got on the train. And, you know, and I, I, I lived that life, and I, you know, uh, over time I had gotten somewhere to live and gotten that job, and so I'd sort of gotten stable, and, yeah, that's, that's when Bob died, and I was, um, I was uh, not confident at all, you know, in my prospects uh, as a writer. Um, but I figured, well, now if no one tries to make this happen, you know, like I'm the only one who can do this at this point. Was how I felt about Bob's um, story, uh, and I and I felt just very propelled uh, to try it because I I think I wanted to try and fail so I could move on. You know, um, I could I could I could try to get an agent. Everyone would say no, that's a nonfiction book with aliens, and it. it's got a misspelled title and two fonts, and so the answer is no. And then I could move on with my life, um, and I could sort of be left alone. You know, I think to a certain extent since the day that Bob's manuscript showed up in my life, I've been sort of dealing with having received it. Um, but, you know, to your question of did I know, or, you know, why why did he send it to me, the thing I always say to people is I think he wanted help with his writing and I was the writer that he knew. But I also think yeah. he probably sensed that I am someone who is also weird in my ways. You know, I'm also not normal in my ways. I think I'm also someone who's just positioned a little bit to be a little skeptical and to sort of maybe believe people who are uh, generally less socially powerful. And so, you know, who knows? But after his death, one of the things that became apparent was he had kept a photocopy of the manuscript that he had sent the typewritten original of to me. So I had for all those years thought, oh, I've got the only copy of this thing on planet Earth. But that wasn't true. He had kept mm -hmm. a photocopy. Um, and perhaps, you know, that was a manipulation on his part, you know, that I would think that I, <laughs> who knows. Um, and it also turned out there were other people in the family who'd received photocopies of that same manuscript who had, you know, thrown them out, not, not paid them any mind. Um, and I think, you know, so it wasn't that I was the only person that he had tried with, but I was the person who he sent the original to. Um, and there were other family members, you know, who after his death, after I interviewed them and such, said, you know, Bobby knew you were going to do this. And I would say, that's impossible. I didn't know I was going to do this. But I think, you know, there's a lot of questions here where we can't ultimately know. Uh, and so how did I get an agent? Um, I started emailing people um, and asking them to coffee, which is not how you're supposed to do it. Um, and I, I went to coffee with about seven editors, and I would say six of them looked at me sideways when I tried to describe this book about my uncle. Um, and then the seventh, who's my agent, um, uh, I, was someone who, when I described this thing, his his whole expression changed, you know. He really, he really heard it. And I think maybe it was the first time I'd ever described to someone what I was up to and really had them hear it. And it turned out he had family with, with a diagnosis. And so he's someone who's really, I think, lived these, these topics more in, in his own life. And so after that meeting, I said to myself, well, if I can come up with 90 or so pages that um, won't be an embarrassment to send to that guy, I will. And I eventually did. And he called me and he said, you're going to remember this phone call for the rest of your life and so far I have 
Um, and then a couple of months later, he uh, he sent it out to publishers, and we got the meeting with Nan Graham at Scribner, and she signed. And, and, and the rest is history, and we're and out of <laughs> and we're out of time. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much I, for sharing this with us. I I just wish that um, we could all have empathy towards someone who has mental illness, because it could happen to anyone. That's true. Well, thank you, Sandy. And Thank you so much. And thank you, Mom. And see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Bye-bye. Bye.